back there. Over there, and I hope everybody is aware, of course, that books are here courtesy of the bookstall at Chestnut Court, the number one independent bookstore in America. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, who's grateful for lunch? Woo! Um, I want to just say thank you to whoever set those gifts of abundance in front of us. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work. And actually, if you don't mind, Diana, I would like to thank Jill's solicitor. Oh, there they are. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, actually adored about this project is how many people show me things on their cell phones uh, that they have gotten from their children or their grandchildren that are about gratitude. And I received a couple of those gifts just during the break. Uh, you were the one who came up with me, you had the little picture, immersion in gratitude, or immersed in gratitude. She got a picture of a grandchild and an uncle, a cousin at, at an aquarium. And, uh, and uh, the title that was put on it was Immersed in Gratitude. And, uh, and it's just, the, it's, it's, when you start paying attention to it, you begin to see it everywhere. Um, yesterday, you know, people are always saying, well, what, what are some examples of this? Um, yesterday, I was picked up at O'Hare by a fellow who is called, his job is that he's he, a media escort. And so um, he, picks, he picks people up at the airport uh, who are going to be on television or on book tour. They have to be in different places around Chicago related to books, music, arts, all those things. And he delivers them to where they need to be and gets you to the next place. And so yesterday I was driving around with Bill, um, the media escort, and um, he actually had one of those beautiful stories that I had heard in a long time. And it just so happens that his partner... Um, is a well-known romance novelist. They live here in the Chicago area. And uh, she's been on the New York Times bestseller list any number of times and very, 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 very successful um, writer. Now, they're both in their 60s. And um, as a way of paying it forward, as it were, um, and sharing their gifts and sharing gratitude with uh, their readers, in the last couple years, they have taken several weeks in the summer and they go someplace. Uh, this year they're, they're heading to Maine, but they, they mostly go to a state that is largely rural and has a lot of little small towns. And they stop at little libraries in little small towns all over these, these places. And um, they, so literally this internationally famous author shows up at a library in a town of 500 people. And they have these little events where she does a reading. Um, you know, people, of course, uh, hopefully buy books from them. Uh, but they also raise money for the local uh, pet shelters, and they do dog adoptions. And so he was telling me this story about how this little project has come to mean so much to them. And it was, it was absolutely fascinating listening to him because as, I was, as we were talking about a whole bunch of stuff, it was pretty obvious that he was a, a very progressive Bernie Sanders voter who would be not terribly comfortable in some small rural towns in Maine. Um, but this is what gratitude is doing um, in their lives. It's causing them to go literally beyond the political boundaries of which they're comfortable into places where people, you know, radically are, seem to be disagreeing about sort of their political and social visions, and yet they found this way to encourage reading, to support local public libraries, to be in community, uh, to attract new audiences to his partner's um, books, and to care for dogs. And how great is that? Because like liberals and conservatives both like dogs. 
<laughs> Unless you're allergic to them, I guess, or if you're a cat person. Maybe you like cats, but we could, buy, we could get you a cat. Um, <laughs> and so he was explaining this, and I just thought to myself, what a powerful story about um, living gratefully. You know, they have everything they need. They don't have to make any more money off of selling books. They've been incredibly blessed. And now they spend part of their summer in RV going around towns where there are people who would not vote the same way they do to try to build social capital around things that matter to what it means to be Americans together. And that's a story about gratitude. That's a story about... about um, how Thanksgiving can really shape us. So I'm just inspired by this. I have visions in my mind of, of going to uh, Arkansas and taking a van and going to every little church that I can find. <laughs> and so, uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's what I'll do. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be fun? Instead of staying in our ghettos, that would be so great. Okay. I want to start with this wonderful quote. Uh, from Brother David Stendhal Rast, who is one of the major uh, sort of spiritual gurus, if you can call a Catholic brother a spiritual guru, he certainly counts it. He just had his 90th birthday. Um, he's one of the major writers on gratitude um, alive today in the United States. If you're grateful, you're not fearful. And if you're not fearful, you're not violent. If you're grateful, you act out of a sense of enough and not a sense of scarcity, and you are willing to share. If you are grateful, you are enjoying the differences between people, and you are respectful to everybody. And that changes this power pyramid under which we live. Amen. And that's what I want to talk about right now. Oh, man. Part of the story of the book is that, and I alluded to it last time, I wrote this book during 2015 and 2016, and the beginning of 2017. I have to sort of talk about this in order for it to make sense. Um, so I'm going to say some political things right now, um, but um, I hope that they will simply be received as my story. And when we tell our stories to one another, um, one of the things that happens is that because it's my story, it doesn't mean I hate your story. It just means it's my story. And I expect that there are people who would have different stories about these same months. And, you know, if we sat down and had lunch together and you told me your story, I would want to receive it as your story. That's part of what we've lost in this culture today, is the capacity to care and respect, as uh, David Stendhal Ross says there, to be respectful of everyone's stories. And so I want to share with you a little bit about my story from 2015, 2016, early 2017. That's not a partisan kind of thing. It is political, but it's not partisan. And it's an attempt to just um, explain where the book is coming from, and it helps to highlight why I think it's important today. So for those uh, 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 of, of all of us here, let's not worry about it. Uh, we're all friendly. We just had lunch. Uh, <laughs> God is with us, and, uh, and uh, we'll go into some territory that right now people are sometimes afraid of, but I don't want you to be afraid because we're grateful together. So the external shape of gratitude. My story is... Remember I said I started working on this book in November of 2015. Um, the contract was signed with Harper uh, Collins, who is my publisher, longtime publisher, in April of 2016. The due date for the book was April 30th, 2017. And so in the spring of 2016, I began researching, laying out the book, thinking about gratitude, thinking back on my own life, looking for examples of gratefulness in the culture. And what we all know, no matter sort of where we are um, politically, is that 2016 was a very difficult year in the United States. We had had the run-up into 2016 around things like Black Lives Matter. And here in Chicago, my, my gosh, the violence, you know, that we've been living with, especially around minority communities, 
and the sense of what are we going to do about this. And, the, and, and um, you know, every time I would turn on the news for a couple months there and I'd see a story about a young black man being shot in some street in America, you know, it was, it was breaking my heart, in part because I, I think um, that I'm a really pretty nice white person. And um, I actually was under the delusion that racism was over, you know? And I think that that's one thing that a lot of white people are afraid to sort of admit in public, is that we sort of thought it was better than it was. I certainly thought it was better than it was. And so I started seeing all these things, and it was really upsetting to me. And so I was already upset, and then the, the elections began. And on both sides, invective, argument, accusations, people calling one another names. And then we moved more deeply into those political campaigns. And I know that lots of people were upset by lots of things that they saw. You know, I live in Washington, D.C. I'm a Democrat. I have a lot of Republican friends. And they were heartbroken about what they were seeing with their own party. And I was really stressed about what I was seeing with my party. Uh, the name-calling, the violence at political rallies. Um, I have friends who work in the media who were coming back from some of those rallies and they were terrified because they were being uh, really scapegoated by these huge crowds of people and they were afraid for their lives for simply going to work to try to write a story that would appear in a newspaper. Um, and so you might guess that it became increasingly difficult to write a, write a book about gratitude. As a matter of fact, I, I was looking at the news and looking at all the stuff in the world around me, and I said, oh, I can't do this right now because all of my books have emerged from this gut place in where I am as a, as a person and as a writer. I have to feel the thing I'm writing about, and I didn't feel grateful. I felt worried. I felt afraid. And so I said to m myself, said to my husband, said to my editor, don't worry about me. I'll do a little research. I'll keep sort of focused on the parts of the book I can focus on, but I'm mostly going to lay it aside. And I promise you, I will pick it up again on November 9th, 2016, <laughs> when everything has gone back to normal. <laughs> and whatever we got right now, I think we can all agree, it's just not normal. <laughs> and so, so when November 9th comes around again, this is my story. I'm lying in bed in the morning, my blanket's over my head, and my husband comes in, I hear him come in the room, I pull my blankets down a little bit, look up. He has a cup of coffee in his hand, and I said, tell me I had a nightmare. And he said, uh, no. He said, Donald Trump is the next president of the United States. <laughs> I pulled the covers over my head again, and I started crying. And that was the beginning of about six weeks of crying. Um, and... Um, I live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. on a very modest middle-class street in Fairfax County. And most of the people on my street are Fairfax County school teachers. They work in the Smithsonian. Um, they're kind of middle managers at places like the EPA and the Agriculture Department. Lots of naval officers live on my street. They're kind of, uh, you, some of you probably know these people. They're probably, <laughs> you know, your relatives in some cases. These are the, the what I call the Washington, D.C. worker bees. You know, the people who have given their lives, their careers for public service. Oftentimes at pretty, good, pretty great expense to themselves, making less money, you know, working for the government and these do-gooder kind of organizations than they would in private business. And they were all upset. Everybody on my street was crying. And um, what would happen was, between the election and really Hanukkah and Christmas, uh, we spent a lot of time together trying to understand what was going on in the world and what was going to happen and how we were going to navigate what we knew was going to be not normal. 
So it wasn't until Christmas that I started thinking about the book again. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I have a book on gratitude due on April 30th. <laughs> what am I going to do? I waited until right after the holiday and I called my publisher and I said, can I write about something else? <laughs> I said, I don't see how gratitude is going to fit, you know, in this moment at all. And uh, my publisher says something to me that I will never forget. And they said, you know, Diana, you're a very intuitive person. And we worked through this process together. And we discerned that gratitude was the thing that you should write about. Something about this project holds meaning for our, our world right now. And we want to support you in that but we're not going to change the topic. And so there I was, under contract to write a book about something I didn't feel at a time in which I was disoriented and frightened would be the best words to describe it. And so I went into my office and I started to write. That was about the third week of... Um, of January, and um, as it happened, the I sent the book in a couple months later, and when I, on the day that I sent it in, it happened to be the 100th day in which Donald Trump was president of the United States. So it became kind of a joke in my publish uh, with my publisher that they think that they had the only liberal woman in the world who was writing a book on gratitude in the first 100 days Donald Trump was president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> I think they're right. <laughs> I think I was the only one. It's a very small club. And so um, what happened was every morning I would get up and I would, I would watch the news, I would read the newspaper. There were things that I saw that I, that I you know, we're all kind of going like this. Oh my gosh, what is happening? And um, then I would just sort of have my coffee, I would rally, and I would say one thing out loud that I was grateful for. My garden beginning to grow, you know, whatever it was. Some small thing. And then I would go in my office and I would work for five to six hours writing about gratitude. And that's how I spent the first 100 days. Um, of Donald Trump being president of the United States. And so this, this book had this incredible political background of all this stress and anger and yelling at one another and all these things that are going on, and there I am trying to do this. And one thing I learned was that gratitude is actually not an escape but it is a way of seeing the world differently. And it's a very empowering way of seeing the world. So it's a way of feeling, it's a way of acting, it's, it's an emotion and it's an ethic. Those of you who are confused by action and ethic, you know, I just mean by ethic, the, the moral actions that create a way of life by which we live in the world. So it's an emotion and it's an ethic, but it's also a way of seeing, a way of understanding uh, the world around us that, that gives us some choices to make. And this is what I call the external shape of gratitude. This picture is back. There he is again. Um, I pointed out just very briefly some of the things that my students over the years have pointed to me about this being a racialized picture, a genderized picture, a picture of a distant God, a very European um, interpretation of what God is like from five, six, seven centuries ago. There's something else about this picture <coughs> that um, I'm sure someone in this room uh, is either an artist or an art historian or you know just loves uh, loves uh, art and um, my grandfather was an artist so I actually grew up one of the things I knew was that artists not only paint pictures of things that they want to communicate but they actually paint within pictures certain kinds of structures and cues about the way that they want you to see the world and so this is a fascinating picture because look at the structure of the picture It's a pyramid. Well, 
why would anybody depict God like that? What in the world is trying to be communicated there? And I heard somebody say it, because usually the Trinity, of course. Um, so usually somebody says that, you know, in terms of the theology of Christianity. There's something else, though, that's going on um, with that, because I, I think the Trinity is, is a, the, one of the right answers, but there's a second answer here, too. It's, it, well, it seems stable. Mm -hmm. He's at the top, right. This is the structure of medieval society. It's the structure of medieval society. Medieval society was this. It was a pyramid-shaped political, economic, and social system where the king was on the top, and then you went down. We just saw a lovely example of this this morning on television. You go down through the ranks of all of the different groups of people, and you finally get to the commoners, and then the servants, and the serfs, and then in medieval society, of course, um, slaves, and that's the way society is structured. Medieval people believed that this structure of society was divinely ordained. And so to link God with the pyramid was really a vision of their world. Now, we live in a democratic society. It doesn't mean we are without pyramids. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but this kind of really overt pyramid structured society um, is one that sometimes we feel a little distant from uh, when we're watching things like royal weddings. But this is also sort of the deep structure of much of Western society, at least over 1,500 years um, since the time of Jesus and further back than that in the origins of what becomes Western society. Um, and here we have, of course, one of the things you study in World Civ, where the pyramid comes from. Uh, Egypt, one of the primary sources for what becomes Western culture. They were pretty obvious about it. They even built their buildings this way in order to show that it was an architecture of the world, it was an architecture of society, it was an architecture of religion. So pharaoh, government officials, etc. You get the point. Um, this pyramid is in the background of much of the Hebrew Bible. This is what the Jews during the Exodus were being freed from. And it's fascinating because when God has the slaves be freed, when God has the Israelites be freed, they don't go out in the wilderness and establish another pyramid-shaped society. As a matter of fact, they go out into the wilderness and they set up villages that have judges in the village. And the vision is that every single person in the society will have his or her own vine or fig tree, that they're going to be farmers. And it is an agrarian, agricultural, communal vision of a society that's based around abundance and 12 tribes that are inter-cooperative, but no tribe superior to another, no pyramid. Um, in the book of Samuel, the, the ancient Jews go, hey, we want to be like the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, and, you know, we want a king like our neighbors. In other words, they were saying to God, we want, we, we're sick of this judges and tribes thing. We want to build a pyramid of, of, of this kind of society and be rich like our neighbors. And God says to the people of Israel, that is a very bad idea. And uh, the people of Israel say, no, 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 we really want a king. And there's this wonderful chapter where, where literally God says to them, if you get a king, it means your taxes will go up, there will be more war, that you will not have, uh, that there will be oppression, that justice will be lost in the land. Um, it's going to be a very bad scene. And the people of Israel say, no, we, wa we want a king. And God says, okay. And the entire rest of the Hebrew Bible 
is the result of that chapter. And it's not very good. Because what keeps happening, even though there are a couple good kings along the way, I remember sitting in Old Testament class when I was in college, and you have to look few and far between for the good kings. You get lots and lots of really, 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 really bad kings. And then you get, of course, these terrible wars, and the people of Israel get hauled off into slavery and exile and all this kind of stuff. It is a terrible, terrible story. And the prophets arise to critique these kinds of pyramid systems and to call Israel back to what God had dreamed of in the first place, a different kind of society, one that resisted the structure of pyramid. Well, it just didn't work. So by the time you get to the New Testament, people of Israel, they aren't under Pharaoh anymore, but they are under this. They're under the worst pyramid-shaped social structure that was ever invented by humankind, ancient Rome. Now, what's interesting is that it's the same structure, but it's also a, got an invisible component to it because there are the, the, the few people at the top, Caesar and the imperial family, you know, floating down then to the slaves. When it comes to wealth and power, the pyramid goes this way because those few people have all the power and they have all the wealth. And uh, these people down here have nothing. And so what's interesting is, I think you said it was stable. Uh, not really. Because if you have a society where there are massive amounts of people on the bottom who have nothing, it's not really that stable of a pyramid. As a matter of fact, I've always wondered about these structures because they're sort of inherently not stable. Because there are all these folks down here who are feeling the, the brunt of this system. So why should they stay in it becomes the question. In Rome, two things happen to keep this stable, this inherently unstable, unfair, oppressive system in place. Um, one was the incredible use of violence. It's really one of the only ways you can keep this going is to have a big army that scares the crap out of everybody. Um, but two, they developed within it a really interesting set of social ties around gratitude. And the way it worked was this way, is that everybody at the top of this system was considered to be a patron toward everyone who was under them in the system. This is where we get the idea of patriarchy, that the people at the top were responsible to care for the people at the bottom. And so the patron had a responsibility to provide protection, money, and the access to some limited amount of power to the clients, the people who were under the patronage system, and then the clients, the people who received provision, money, and access, or protection, money, and access, those clients they had a responsibility to return to the patron loyalty, thanks, and allegiance. Now, that's a very interesting system, and it uses words that we still use today. Uh, the patron, uh, this arc right here, those things, protection, money, and access to power, those were called gratia. Yeah. And those are, and when, we, when we're looking at this part of the system, the gratia is translated as grace, favor, or gifts. So the patron gives gratia, grace, favor, and gifts, to the client. And then we use the exact same word in Latin, gratia, coming from the client of loyalty, thanks, and allegiance, but now it's called gratitude. Back up to the, the patron. So this is a system of gratia, gifts, and gratitude. Gifts and gratitude. And that's what holds this all together. 
Caesar up there was considered to be the ultimate benefactor. The title Caesar can be legitimately translated as Lord and Savior of the universe. And so if you were living in this system, say you're a slave down here, and you have one piece of moldy bread to eat in a day, that piece of bread came to you from Caesar, a gift from the Lord and Savior of the universe. And you were required to give back to Caesar your loyalty and your gratitude. It was not always, it was not terribly benevolent in certain ways. We're going to talk about those. Um, it was held together by the force of law. You couldn't just choose to be grateful to Caesar. There's a whole set of laws in ancient Rome that were called the obsequium laws. And those laws made it a crime to be an ingrate to a person who was your patron or your superior. And if you broke the obsequium laws by refusing to give your loyalty, by not offering a tribute, which was usually in the form of taxes and money, or by just simply saying, not saying thank you for the gift, you could be sent to jail, your property could be seized, your children could be sold off into some distant form of slavery, drafted into the Roman army. You could be sent to prison or exiled or killed. So to be an ingrate was a crime, a crime against Caesar. Ingratitude was not a choice. It was the law uh, to be grateful. Now, we often think about this still, if you think about this today, um, we often think about gratitude and gifts and giving in terms of thinking about benefactors and benevolence, again, two words with Latin roots, where we think of a, a person who is wealthier giving to a person who is poorer. That comes right out um, of this ancient system. It's our memory, as it were, of that ancient system. And the problems here were interesting because what happened to the people on the bottom is that they, there was never enough for them to be actually able to return enough gratitude to Caesar. And so, you know, if Caesar fed you, if Caesar protected you from the invading hordes of barbarians, if Caesar's uh, piety sent rains so that your fields um, had crops in a particular year, um, all of those incurred debts of gratitude to Caesar. Now you can imagine you're at the bottom of this. Your obligation is to pay Caesar back. Well, what are you going to pay Caesar back with? Um, in the, the Bible that we read, when they talk about taxes, those fishermen there by the Sea of Galilee, they paid 95% of everything they made back to Caesar. And the last 5% they were allowed to live on. And so what happened to the poor is the poor are down here. And they're going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And they are debts that can never be discharged. So they are completely trapped by this system. There is no way to ever be free from it. Now, of course, some people figured this out. And they said, hmm, not only can we run up these debts of obligation with the poor, and that keeps them functionally enslaved to us, but we can give them gifts in order to control them. And so develop this idea of quid pro quo. The idea that you give something to someone only to get something back. And so these two problems indebtedness and quid pro quo began to infect this system, weighting it down and increasing its in inequalities and its injustices until it was actually impossible for people, the very people that Jesus was talking to, to breathe. 
They aren't called slaves in the Bible, but for all intents and purposes, they are slaves to this political system. And it was a, a, a wretched thing um, in ancient Rome. Now, some ancient Romans knew this. Cicero, for example, loved the idea of a society based on gratitude. But he imagined that what should happen is that patrons should be benevolent, that they should not use their gifts to manipulate other people, and they should give gifts that are appropriate, not indebting people to the point of slavery. And so Cicero argued for the cleaning up of the system, mostly by creating benefactors who would work for the good rather than for their own quid pro quo benefit. And so Cicero says, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but it is the parent of all others. In other words, we will never have a virtuous Rome, which is the vision of Rome, to be a truly virtuous republic. We will never have a virtuous Rome as long as we have a corrupt system of gratitude. And so what we have to do is we have to clean up the system of gratitude and take out quid pro quo and indebtedness of gratefulness. But the thing that was interesting about Cicero is he never suggested that the system was the problem. All he suggested was that the corruption of the system was the problem. And that brings us to this guy. <laughs> if you know that background to the New Testament, all of a sudden a couple of stories in the New Testament come out entirely differently than what we were taught in Sunday school. What's the story? Yeah, Zacchaeus, there he is. Uh, how many people here have seen a children's choir sing the Zacchaeus song about the wee little man in the tree? <laughs> we got a few people who are singing it in the back row already. Um, <laughs> it's a Sunday school song. It's often used by children's choirs in church. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. And uh, the story is pretty simple. Is that Zacchaeus is a tax collector. In Jericho, he is, not, he is the chief tax collector, and he hears that Jesus is coming to town. And so, as the story goes, Zacchaeus runs uh, to the gates of Jericho as Jesus is getting ready to come into town. But Zacchaeus is short. He's a wee little man. And so he can't see. He climbs up in a sycamore tree uh, to get a better view of Jesus. And then they have this really interesting exchange. Now, what I would like to suggest here is that this is a story about gratitude. Because you see the guy in the tree right there. Zacchaeus is part of this system. Now, he's a Jew. Jews are all down here in this, this system. These are the people who are at the bottom of this oppressive structure of Rome. So how does Zacchaeus get to be a tax collector? Did he go to Harvard? <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't work like that in Rome. What happened was the Romans were really smart. And one of the things that they used to do is they used to sell, auction off, a certain amount of higher level positions, mostly in this area right here, to people who were part of oppressed and enslaved populations. And so a tax collector, which was one of the most hated of all jobs, and if you think about a tax collector, you think the IRS is bad, no way compared to this. Um, a tax collector was hated by everybody down here from whom he's collecting the taxes, and he was not trusted by anybody from up there because he might be skimming off of the money that would be going back up. And so the tax collector is stuck in this middle section with everybody above him not trusting him and everybody below hating him. It was not a very good job. And so the Romans auctioned off a certain number of those positions. So Zacchaeus obviously won an auction for his job. He bought his position. And so what you could do is you could move up by purchasing a higher social and economic status for yourself and your family. 
So Zacchaeus had done that, and he was not only, he had not only purchased his job, but evidently he was pretty good at it because he was elevated within that system to being the chief tax collector in Jericho, which is a really important mercantile city in that part of the Mediterranean world. Now, why would Zacchaeus want to see Jesus? Jesus has been talking about taxes. Jesus has been in all these other towns saying stuff about Caesar, giving sermons about taxes and money. And Zacchaeus is terrified at what this guy is going to say when he comes into town. Is he going to wor- tell everybody not to pay their taxes? In which case, it's going to be Zacchaeus's neck that's going to be on the line. Um, is he going to encourage them to pay their taxes? In which case, Zacchaeus is going to get in trouble with the local rabbis. This is a bad moment for Zacchaeus in every possible way. And so what Zacchaeus does is he's got to keep an eye on Jesus. So he runs to the edge of the town, and he climbs up a tree in order to keep an eye on Jesus because Zacchaeus always is a climber. He has climbed above everybody here in order to get his job. Whenever Zacchaeus wants something, he climbs. And Jesus walks into town. He sees Zacchaeus up there. And Jesus, being Jesus, says, Zacchaeus, you come down from that tree. This is Jesus saying, Zacchaeus, get out. Get out of that system. Can't you see that that system is killing you? You don't want to be part of a pyramid like that. You don't want to be climbing above people in order to get ahead. You don't want to be in the precarious position of sitting on that branch up there all by yourself, just waiting for somebody to saw it off. Get out of that tree. And Zacchaeus, it's just amazing, Zacchaeus immediately says, Yes, and climbs down out of the tree, and Jesus then adds, and this is how you know it's not about something that's spiritual. It's actually about the politics of this structure. Jesus says the next thing. He says, I'm coming to your house today to eat. And why is that political? It's because this structure of the debt and duty system that was established by the Roman Empire, one of its main currencies was dinner invitations. It was one of the gifts that you could give to someone that they would have to discharge or they would be in your debt. And dinner invitations were also used as quid pro quo. If you invited someone to dinner at your house, They were required to invite you back. And so dinner invitations put people in debt, and they were used as part of the currency of oppression. There is no one in this picture anywhere standing around here with Jesus and Zacchaeus who was watching this happen who didn't know that. And part of the radicalness of this story is the fact that Jesus, who is a lower status person, he is just some rambling mystic rabbi who claims to have the ability to heal people, who's going throughout the, is, the Palestinian countryside, stirring up trouble and raising questions about taxes. He is at the bottom of the social pyramid. Zacchaeus is in the middle of the social pyramid. Zacchaeus is the higher status person. By Roman law, Zacchaeus has to invite Jesus to dinner. And if Zacchaeus had done that, that would put Jesus in Zacchaeus' debt. Jesus beats the system completely by saying to Zacchaeus, calling him out of the tree, standing side by side and saying, I'm coming to your house today. Jesus invites himself to supper before Zacchaeus can do this to him. And so Zacchaeus is stunned and says, yes, 
yeah, come to my house. And you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to give back all of the money I stole, and I'm going to repay everyone I cheated multiple times. And so Zacchaeus' response is, and do you think you can be a tax collector and give back all the money you stole and repay everybody multiple times? Zacchaeus is actually saying to Jesus, I quit my job. He's like the guys at the lake who just let down their nets and fishes and they go and they follow Jesus. And he says, I quit my job. And yes, I can't wait to have you for dinner. And Jesus' response is, salvation has come to this house today. This story is so remarkable because it's Jesus calling Zacchaeus out of a pyramid structure of corrupted gratitude to be around a table of real thanksgiving. It is the move from this to this. I've become convinced that this, is, this little story of Zacchaeus is actually the Christian exodus story. It is the story that takes us out of Pharaoh's system of enslavement and debt-based gratitude and sits us around a table with all of the people that you never expected to be there who are free of these kinds of corruptions of gratitude who are freely thankful, who are living for the good, not in quid pro quo. Um, the table. That crazy table keeps showing up. I love that there's a cat at the table. <laughs> <laughs> there's all kinds. I, 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 I wonder where the dog is. You know, I guess the dog's under the table. Wait, <laughs> if it's anything like my dog, the dog is, the dog is down there. I mean, it's an extraordinary story about a different kind of life that is really possible for all of us. Um, it is a life that is not about quid pro quo, but is about pro bono, for the good. Those two words are actually the opposites of each other in Latin. Um, and it's for free. This is what we call grace um, in the New Testament. Free gifts for the good is grace. It's one of the most radical things that is taught in the entire Bible. And it would be nice if we ever understood it. Um, but <laughs> there you have it. Free gifts. Free gifts. People say there is no free lunch. Sorry. That's all Jesus was about was free lunch. <laughs> the whole Bible is about free lunch. And so, uh, so sitting around the table for free. Um, and Jesus makes this point again. This is a direct attack from Jesus on the quid pro quo system. Uh, Jesus said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. Get out of the quid pro quo. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In other words, you're going to get your quid pro quo so long from now that it won't even matter to you. It's way, way off in the future. So the blessing is that you're not going to be repaid. You know how many sermons I've heard preached on that verse? I think maybe one in 50 years of, of being in churches. It's an amazing verse. It means exactly what it says. There are times when I'm such a literalist, and, and this, this verse is one of those verses. It means exactly what it says. And then it's also this. So we live pro bono for the good, and we live free of debt. God discharges the debts. The debts are discharged in the Hebrew Bible by Sabbath and Jubilee. The debts are discharged in the New Testament by the death of Christ and by the giving of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself says, congratulations Presbyterians, you got the translation right. Um, Pray then like this and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I remember I grew up Methodist and then Episcopal, so we always use trespasses. Um, but this is probably what Jesus really said. Um, Jesus 
uttered this prayer in Aramaic, and then it was translated into Greek. So Jesus didn't speak Greek, which is the language it's written in in the New Testament. Um, in Luke, uh, the people who rendered it into Greek rendered it as trespasses. Matthew rendered it as debts. And the word in Aramaic here um, that Jesus probably would have said for sin, which is the word, is not sin as a naughty stuff, but the word for sin in Aramaic was debt. Debt and sin were interlaced ideas in Hebrew and Aramaic. And so Jesus says, forgive us our debts. Forgive every time that we have been pushed down into the system. Forgive us our debts. We can't live like this anymore. We want to be free as we forgive our debtors. So we're going to forgive the people who have, who have done this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's an amazing verse. And so that's the gratitude equation. An awareness of grace, the awareness of free gifts, of a pro bono life and freedom from debt. Um, <laughs> a few weeks ago, a fellow stood up at the end of one of my talks, and he was um, a, an investment banker, and uh, he was pretty upset about this. Um, and he uh, literally said to me, he said, do you have a mortgage? And I said, yes, actually, I do have a mortgage. Well, he said, well, that's just a pile of crap. He was very angry. And I said, well, you know, there's a big difference between the ancient Roman idea of indebtedness and a person in the 20th century entering into a contract to borrow money from a bank on the basis of that person being able to pay it. So what we're, we're not talking here about a mortgage, and we're not talking about here whether Citibank is going to let you have a credit card. We're not talking about a contract that you enter into willingly with someone who is going to loan you money. We're talking about a system of bondage that no one in the ancient world entered in willingly, that people were held into, a system of oppression whereby the few had everything and the many had nothing. And that's what Jesus is working to free us from, out of debt to the table. That's what it means to live in abundance. When Jesus says, I, I came to give you life and that you might know it abundantly, that's Jesus' idea of abundance. Well, Christians didn't listen too terribly well. <laughs> and within about 200 years, what did we do? Is we created Jesus at the top of a big old social and church-based pyramid scheme basically dressing Jesus up like the Roman Empire and putting ourselves back into a sort of a quid pro quo system of salvation. I don't know what it is about us human beings. Pyramids seem easier, but they always wind up badly. That's what God said, at least. And so we wind up with two sorts of visions of Christianity operative, the imperial vision of Christianity, the Roman Empire vision of Christianity, and the real one table and this is what I'm kind of wondering right now who wants to live with that isn't this part of what the anxiety is right now in our culture all those people in Ohio that were screaming that they were in financial duress and they wanted something entirely different you know, all those stories that we read in the New York Times, I think we now are up to about 108 of them, about people who were the Trump voters. They all said stuff like this. They wanted to be free from debt. They wanted to have a different kind of economic vision. What happens, of course, with most people when we're stuck in these kinds of pyramid systems is that we think if a pyramid system comes down, and we happen to be maybe up at the top part of the pyramid system, we think that the people who are at the bottom are just going to move over and set up a different pyramid, and they're going to put themselves at the top, and they're going to put us at the bottom as punishment. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
You don't have to replace one oppressive pyramid with another. That's only something that sadly enough we do when we're not paying much attention to history. What you can do is you can think about a different way of being a society. And every single Sunday, those of us who are Christians imagine that society around a table where we celebrate the Eucharist. It's not a pyramid. It's this. And when we enact that, we're beginning to enact the dream of God. The dream of God where every person has their own vine and fig tree. The dream of God where Sabbath is celebrated. The dream of God where debts and money move freely and justly throughout society. From people who are benevolent givers who have no expectation of return. From people who can enter freely into contractual arrangements of, of sharing where they actually can pay things back and not be held in slavery by others. It's what the Bible is all about. And I guess for me, the dream is that we Christians understand this at some deep and profound level. And then, wouldn't it be amazing if we could really take this kind of vision into our politics? I'll end back here, and we'll have a little chance to talk with this slide. While I was working on the book um, during that busy campaign year, uh, this text came up in the lectionary, and it just so happened that that week I was preaching in a church in Canada. Uh, the town where I was in, uh, where I was preaching, has a major university in Canada, and the 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 church. It's a United Church of Canada congregation. sits right on the edge of the campus um, of, of the college. And so I'm preaching. I'm preaching on this text. I actually preached on the Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek um, texture of this particular word right here. And in the middle of the sermon, <laughs> this happens to me once in a while, I have those Michael Curry moments all the time. I literally went, Jesus dreams of a debt-free world. And I look out, and there are like 20 college students sitting in front of me. And all of a sudden, their faces were like, And so it's the, after the sermon, I'm standing in the back at the door, and I noticed that all these students want to talk to me. So I very quickly got rid of everybody who was older. And uh, the students came up, and they said, did Jesus really say that? <laughs> and I said, I said, yes. Jesus is taking the essential vision of the Hebrew scriptures, that of a debt-free world, and he is reinterpreting it through this, this prayer. And they said, well, that's what we want too. <laughs> and I, 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 until that moment, I really hadn't thought of, of the politics of millennials being about a debt-free world. And so they started telling me their dream of a debt-free world. And one of them got very enthusiastic and said, you mean Jesus is like Bernie Sanders? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, they're both Jews. <laughs> and what I uh, the, the the joy of that moment was so complete because so many Christians right now think that young adults don't want to know anything about the Bible. So many older Christians right now think that their young adult children are completely hopeless when it comes to moral and ethical issues. But I got to tell you, those 20 kids in Ontario, when they heard this word, they were on fire. And they were dreaming like Jesus. It was so powerful. Can we learn to see the world through the eyes of gratitude? This amazing story that is throughout the whole of the New Testament about the abundance of gifts, about table thanksgiving, 
and about taking down structures of debt, pyramids of oppression, not as a way of punishing the wicked or getting them on the bottom of our pyramid, but of setting up a table in the wilderness around which all can eat and share. Can we imagine that? If we can, we're imagining like Jesus. So, thank you so much. We have about 10 or 15 minutes just to engage in some conversation, and then I'll go back and uh, be able to sign some books. So I'm sure there are some questions on this. Uh, <laughs> questions or comments? Who would like to, who would like to begin? Everybody's afraid. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, I think that because we're so used to transactional cultures that we immediately hear that and we interpret it as a transaction. But I think that Jesus' uh, hearers would have not heard it as a future transaction like putting good deeds on deposit where you're going to get a big return at the end of your cash. Um, that would not be the way they would conceive of the world. But instead, as soon as he would say something like this, what, they, what he's really saying is a really long time from now you're going to get your reward. And usually the language, I'd have to go back and look at it. I don't know what exactly it is in Luke 14, 14, but the resurrection of the righteous was considered to be the thing that was going to happen in the age to come. And so um, the age to come is this thing when God's will is fullest, when finally all of history wraps up. And so when Jesus is saying that, they would either be thinking, oh, that's a really long time from now, or when everything is finally resolved, then um, we will experience the blessing for these acts. But it, it would not be a transactional deposit model that very materialistic people born in a capitalist society would have. And that, I'm not name-calling there, because that's, yeah, that's, that's just what we all are. So, yeah, that's a great question. Uh-huh. Oh, I think a lot, you know, and I, just some of these stories themselves, you know, um, as you tell them, they're actually funny. You know, this story is hilarious. Um, and everybody standing there would have been sort of moving between a sense of shock and did he just really say that politically? And probably laughing um, because no one could have imagined that this kind of exchange would happen. And so it probably would release an, actually a great deal of, joy, happiness, levity. Um, I think that gratitude just is, um, th there's a very close relationship between gratitude and, and joy. And if you look at the, the Greek words instead of the Roman words, um, the Greek for gratitude, of course, is charis, um, which from which we get Eucharist. Um, and the, the Greek word for joy is kara. And so there are times, uh, are you a pastor? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, so you know these things then. Um, so, you know, there are times, uh, you kind of look like you know these things. I mean, you had that pastor kind of look about you. Uh, <laughs> it was a moment of levity. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, you probably know these things then, that sometimes in the New Testament, it's really slippery about the translation, whether you um, translate a word as joy or thanks, um, because they are so just near to one another as words. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, I know that Miroslav Wolf, who is big theologian at Yale, he has been working on a project uh, for the last couple years about joy. It's nothing is published yet, so I'm really looking forward to when it is published. Uh, but he has had several people who are gratitude experts working on that project with him. So it's been fascinating to kind of watch that from the side and see how they're interweaving those two concepts. And wouldn't that be great? Because when you're talking about politics of gratitude, it winds up being political, it winds up being economic, it winds up being very radical and interesting and all about Thanksgiving and tables, uh, but it also winds up about happiness. And uh, really what the New Testament seems to be saying is if we live like this, we'll be happier. Mm -hmm. That's right. So this guy just said, if I can kneel to God, I know that I will be happy. Yeah, it's, it's, this is a gratitude system that's clearly based on scarcity. Yeah, and the idea is that there are few gifts and that the right people have to be able to control the flow of gifts to everybody else. And so it's a system based on the idea of scarcity. Um, this system, of course, is not based on that, if you want to call it a system, but this vision is based on the idea of abundance. And um, this vision is that around this table there are gifts. To quote Wendell Berry, everything we need is here. And that um, because uh, the, the gifts are there, the job of us human beings is simply opening up the channels so that the gifts can flow all around the whole of the table. And so those are the two primary approaches. Are gifts limited or are gifts abundant? Becomes sort of one of the dominant questions I think we need to ask ourselves about our own world views. Which do I think? Um, and do I operate? So, so say I, I really do think that the world is about abundance and gifts. Do I operate out of that? Becomes the next or do I really sort of say that but still operate out of an idea of scarcity? Um, most of our politics are based on the idea of scarcity. And, it, and, and notice that what's interesting about that is I, I just said most of our politics. That means Democrats and Republicans. It means the way that we have currently structured the system is based on the idea that there are limited resources and limited gifts and that someone needs to control the flow of those gifts. And then we have to, of course, in the scarcity politics, not only do you have to figure out how to control, who controls the flow of gifts and how to control the flow of gifts, but the next question is who gets the gifts? So who are the appropriate beneficiaries? And if you think about it in that way, basically Democrats and Republicans have the same structure for the most part but are simply arguing for the different um, benefactors and different beneficiaries and how we control the gifts that move from one to the other. But we still use this language all through our, po our politics. We use benefactors, benefits, beneficiaries, entitlements. We're talking right now about things like white privilege it's all a language that's tied up in this kind of thing, and it's the idea of scarcity. That's the driving factor behind our politics. And um, I think we resist talking about abundance, especially in Christian circles. We resist talking about abundance because it sounds like the prosperity gospel. You know, it sounds like the prosperity gospel. And, uh, or, or, or uh, maybe new age religion. Um, and... Um, as it to what one of my friends says, what's wrong with that? <laughs> so uh, I said, no, you know, not really. I, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, but, um, but we tend to be reluctant to talk about abundance uh, because we haven't talked about it. We haven't really thought about it as a deeply Christian frame. And I think it might well be time.
for us to, and you brought, brought it up so beautifully, I think it's, it's really time for us to imagine that theology. And I think that's where Paul is pushing us by opening Thessalonians with thanks. I'm thankful for you all. He opens with this line of abundance. It's not, oh, I'm just thankful for the few of you who happen to believe in Jesus and you're the ones who are going to heaven. I'm thankful for all of you. So it's really amazingly beautiful. Yeah, go, ahead, Jason. Which one? The. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, and, and that does relate to scarcity and abundance um, very much. Is Sometimes, excuse me, when I've heard this, this verse quoted, um, it means you should be grateful for whatever happens to you. And so uh, who among us has not had someone say to us, oh, you should be so thankful that you've gotten that disease because it's really going to be okay in the end. It's like, really? Um, you know, um, I've had people, I, 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 I said this on a radio show recently, I, I one time overheard a fellow who was going to wind up being a pastor tell a woman who had been sexually assaulted she should be thankful for the rape uh, because it was going to teach her something about God and love. It's like, you know, so he was saying be thankful for, for all things. Um, and that's a, that's a really kind of sick idea that, not everything is good. We do live in a universe of abundance, um, but not everything that happens and not every choice that people make in that universe are good choices. And what this word is, is not for all things give thanks. So you don't give thanks for sickness. You don't give thanks for violence. You don't give thanks for injustice. But in all those things, you can find a path of gratitude, a path of abundance, that will take you to a different place. And so that's that. what I was talking about at the very beginning is that gratitude, um, we need to learn to see it differently in those four quadrants. But when we see it differently, it teaches us how to see the world differently. And um, to sort of put a little bow around it in terms of my own story, I got to the end of the 100 days and I sent the manuscript in, the first draft of the manuscript in. We're sitting at the dining room table that night. The news is kind of on. And they were talking about the 100 days of, of first 100 days of Trump being president. And my husband looks at me and he says, 100 days. He said, you know, I think writing this book on gratitude saved you. And I realized that he was right. Because what it had done is it had, it had strengthened me. It had made me more resilient as a human being. So I was far less susceptible to the, the anxiety and the fear that is driven at us every single day, every minute of the day by the news. So I was more resilient against that pressure. But I also had developed the capacity to resist injustice. And that capacity was being able to see how to live in this, how to live around a table. And I really began to imagine um, a different way that we might move ahead. And I also began to see the whole sort of political argument around me entirely differently um, from both sides. And um, it's been a really interesting journey. I'm still not entirely sure where it's going to wind up. But all I do know is what we got right now is so horrible <laughs> um, that people all over the place are longing for a different political language and longing for a new story and longing for real justice and longing for real, really, a, a, a society of far deeper equality. And um, we need to really move there. And if people of faith and, and uh, like-minded humanists and secular people want to move ahead, this is a possible path that we could all share together. 
So that's what that it really taught me about abundance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Right. You're welcome. Yes. And it really it really hit my heart to know that in all the horribleness right. she was graceful and she was very important to have in her home and practice and not was that she was graceful, graceful to her mother, graceful to her friends. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that you would see it with that. Um, yeah. In the book, I quote um, Ellie Wiesel in a really interesting interview with Oprah Winfrey, where he talked about, it, you know, she was talk asking him what, how he had survived the camps, you know, and he said that one of the things that he, that he long ago noticed is the people who could get to gratitude, people who were grateful just to be alive every day, to find something to be grateful for in the midst of that horror he said those were the people who tended to survive and uh, Viktor Frankl writes about that later on Ellie Wiesel writes about that and what I think that it shows us is that you know we, we think times are bad right now but we aren't quite to Nazi Germany and camps and all that kind of stuff there's horrible violence but um, if that is indeed true for the Holocaust, what gratitude does is gratitude has the capacity to resist the, the, the sort of the, the darkest corruptions of the human soul. And that gratitude resists its own corruption. Gratitude did not intend to be used by Caesar the way it was used. That was a corruption of gratitude. And what Jesus comes along and does is he corrects that corruption and says this is what the universe really intends. And so um, that a 13-year-old girl in a high school, or however old she was, um, can get there, if Ellie Wiesel can get there, if the slaves in 19th century America, which is exactly what they did, is they resisted the... the um, the false vision of gratitude that was put on them by the slaveholders, which was really the slaveholders telling them that they needed to be grateful for their captivity because they had become Christians by being enslaved. Um, that's not being grateful. F you're not supposed to be grateful for that. But what the slaves, the people who were enslaved learned is that they could be grateful through it. And that if they were grateful through it, they would survive. And their cultures would be able to flourish, that justice would come, and that they would be able to be empowered in a different kind of community. And I think that's what we're looking at now, is to find that kind of gratitude that is resilience, that frees our hearts. And when we have that, we can find a kind of gratitude that can knit us together in new ways that resist injustice. And wouldn't that be something if out of this moment where we're all so angry at each other and we can barely, my brother has disowned me. My brother is getting married right now in Louisiana and I don't even know it except for my sister told me because he has disowned me and he disowned me over Charlottesville because I um, stood up for, my daughter goes to UVA. I stood up for the protesters. I was horrified by what had happened there and uh, we had a, quite a quarrel and um, he was on the other side of that quarrel, told me I was brainwashed, libtard by Antifa, and that if my daughter got killed in Charlottesville, it would be her own fault because she chose to be on the wrong side of history. That's what you call destroying a family relationship. And so I get this. I'm living right here with you all. This is not Pollyanna moment. This is really me with you looking at this, experiencing this, not wanting to hate one another, not wanting brother and sister to be at odds, but to really imagine what the vision 
of a grateful God, a grateful universe, a grateful people could be in healing who we are. And so that's my dream right now, and I'm walking in this. I am trying, I'm doing my best to live it every day. Not perfectly, but I am living it clearly because I see it now. And I can make a choice. You can make choices. And I'm so glad that you gave me these hours today to share this with, with you. Um, I've never written anything that I was more passionate about. And this was the book that I wrote, not because I was an expert, but because I was in crisis. And aren't we all? Thank you so much.